What's up, heroes? Welcome to episode 68 of the Producer Life Podcast. Today, we've got a really unique guest. I'm joined by Benji Harris, one of the members of the hit country music trio Scarletta. As part of this band, they hit the top 30 on country radio, toured arenas across the country, made an appearance on Good Morning America, The Today Show, and Late Night with Seth Meyers. Currently, Benji is focused on his corporate work with Song Division, where he puts his singing, songwriting, and guitar playing to use entertaining corporate clients and helping to reinforce key points at corporate events. Song Division employs a host of different musicians, including DJs, and corporate gigs can be really lucrative, so you're not going to want to miss this. In this episode, Benji talks about how he got his start in music, moving to Nashville, the challenges of being a touring musician, what Song Division does, and how they've adapted to the pandemic. But first, cue the intro music. This is the Producer Life Podcast with your host, the House Ninja. Bringing you actionable ideas to improve your music and get it heard. All right, Benji, welcome to the Producer Life Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I am really excited to have you on the show. You're the first performer we've had that has done a lot of work with corporations. So um, this should be a really interesting conversation. Definitely. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let's see. Why don't we start at the beginning? How, how did you get your start in music with um, singing, songwriting, playing the guitar? Yeah, great question. Um, my dad had a guitar in his closet ever since I was a little kid. And I remember being, you know, six seven, you know, always wanting to pull the guitar out and just mess with it. I had no idea really how to play it, but something about the strings and the frets and and the hole and the guitar kind of fascinated me. I remember my, my older brother stuffed my little stuffed animal down into the guitar and I freaked out. (laughs) Uh, But so, so, but the guitar was always that thing that I just was interested in. I always wanted to just look at it and pull it out and pluck the strings and stuff. Uh, And that's how my initial interest in it started. And, um, my dad had this chord book, this 1950s black and white Mel Bay teaches guitar chord book where it was just pictures of his hands making chords. And so I remember being about 11 or so. And I just I started I just felt curious. I said, all right, I'm going to I can do that. So I started, you know, making my chord shapes with my hands to match what was in the picture. And I gave it a big strum. And there was the, just this big moment of, wow, cool. That's a guitar chord. So I started teaching myself that way. And then in a, in middle school, uh, in seventh grade, one of two of my buddies, you know, were showing interest in guitar as well. And then we were, uh, we had this brainstorming session in the cafeteria in middle school. We we're like, we should be a band. Let's make a band and let's, <laughs> let's compete in the eighth grade talent show. We'll have a year to practice because next year we'll be in eighth grade. By the time the talent show comes, we'll be a real band and, you know, we can get on stage and, and try to win. So that was the initial motivation of, of, learning how to play well enough to where you could get on stage and not embarrass yourself and, and rock the house. So that's what we did. We, we learned one song and uh, we practiced it over and over and over. We got together in his garage every weekend to play, <laughs> to play this one song. And we, we recruited a drummer and uh, who was also another friend of ours. And we were so inexperienced that we, we didn't even know that you needed to have a bass player. So we had three guitars and, and a drummer, <laughs> but we didn't care. Um, and so that was, I remember it vividly like it was yesterday. Um, so my first performance was in a, in a theater type situation. We were in the auditorium at our middle school in the eighth grade talent show. And uh, it was a very formative experience because i remember the curtains opened we were the opening act of the talent show and the curtains opened and there was a you know 400 people in a theater type of uh auditorium and we played this song and i'm singing and playing guitar and i even had a little guitar solo that i had worked out so that became the moment of wow this is what i want to do it was just a, a clear as day vision of i'm going to do this this is my path you know, so uh, I, I I never stopped doing it. We, that band stayed together through high school, and then I was in some different bands uh, through college, and then um, moved moved to Nashville. So that's how it all got started. Awesome. Did um, was that an original song that you guys performed, or was it a cover song that you did? 
It was a cover song. Uh, it was uh, um, It's All For You by Sister Hazel. I don't know if you remember that okay. song from the 90s. Hard to say what it is. Uh, so that yeah. was the first time, first time doing it. And, you know, we, but what was cool about that band is, you know, we were all, you know, budding creatives. And so we started writing our own songs after that talent show. You know, that band stayed together for four years all the way through through high school. So we started just learning together how to make your band sound better. And, and then one of us would write a song and we'd all learn it and play it. And uh, we then we went into the studio when we were 16 and we cut an eight song album in a day. <laughs> we, did, we went in there just super polished and rehearsed. You know, we rehearsed like crazy. And then we went in there and we cut an eight song EP in a day. And wow. uh, it turned out great. <laughs> my, my friend actually found it and he sent it to me and I listened back to it. And I was like, that's pretty dang good for 16 year olds who didn't know what they were doing. So we, it was a really great learning experience. That's awesome. And what, what was the band's name? The band was called uh, the Southampton All Stars. And uh, All Stars, okay, yeah. And so you know, it was kind of that was in the the days of like you know Blink One Eighty Two, Green Day, Jimmy Eat World. So yeah. we, we we really wanted to be this kind of like pop punk emo kind of thing. Um, that was that was what was cool in the in the early 2000s you know we started the band in 98 and we were banned through 2003 and that was kind of when all those bands were were really hot so that's what we wanted uh what we wanted to sound like okay now in college i think you've got a degree in uh marketing is that right uh advertising yeah advertising yeah. okay so did you continue on with the music industry while you were in college or did that get put on hold Oh no, I was always in a band. You know, my, my parents insisted that I go to college and I, and I get a degree and, uh, I thank them for that because they were right. It's, it's good. You know, there's a lot of things you learn in college, not just for your degree, but socially and, you know, kind of having that time away from your parents. Well, you're still technically on the payroll if they're, if they're paying for college, but you kind of, you'd learn a whole lot, but to answer your question, yes, I was always in a band. I mean, from the eighth grade talent show, throughout my whole life even when i was studying at school i was always playing with other people or or playing by myself um and so i i joined a band in college called uh thief like stealing something thief and uh that was a really great introduction into um writing writing more songs writing better songs and that's that was my first introduction to to touring towards the end of our college career we started uh you know we had a manager which was a big deal mm -hmm. having a manager for the first time for a band and we we booked a little regional tour with a with a band called green river ordinance and so we got in a, in, a, in the white van with a trailer and we went and started playing clubs so that was my first dive into okay, this is what it's like to travel and, and, and play a show every night and be in a different town every night. And, and you start learning all the little things about how to, we, we, you know, what gets a room excited, playing what kind of song at the right moment. And, uh, you know, the early days of, of capturing the email addresses of everyone that's, that's there at the show so you can reach out next time and they come back and bring a friend. So I learned a lot about basic grassroots touring of an unknown band, a new band, uh, but how you start building a following. And it was a really great uh, learning experience for me. And so I was balancing that with college. You know, I would, we'd be in class during the week, but then on the weekends, we'd want to play one of the bars uh, or get on the road and go drive two hours and go play some nowhere club. Uh, a, a lot of great times in college. And then at the, at the end of college is when we, I went and got to go make another record with that band. And that's when I first got in, introduced to Nashville. We had the manager of our band knew a really great producer in Nashville that we were going to go cut um, uh, an eight song EP. So I, that was my first time coming here to Nashville and, and recording with a quote unquote real producer. And uh, again, a, another huge, amazing learning experience for me. Um, and I just fell in love with this town. I was just like, wow, there's music everywhere. There's talent everywhere. And, uh, so I, I made the plan in my mind of, you know, after college, 
I'm going to call this producer and I'm going to, I'm going to beg him to let me come intern. Cause he had a couple interns in the studio when we were making our record, you know, he would say, all right, Hey, go, go set up this mic and position it this way. And, uh, so they would kind of do his bidding during the day, helping these records get made, but he was giving them this education of, you know, here, this is, this is why we use this microphone and this is why placing it in this spot eliminates phasing, you know? And so I thought that would be something really cool to do after college is to go be an intern and, and be his guy. So that's, that's what I did afterwards. I, after college, I said, Hey, I want to come be your intern. He goes, come on. So what was really cool about that experience is I got to have this great mentor musically. When I first got there, I thought I was going to be mostly making coffee and moving microphones and taking out the trash and learning a little bit about engineering. But uh, a really great thing happened on day one of my internship. The guitar player that was going to come in and overdub some guitar parts on this record he was working on uh, couldn't make it. And then he looked at me and he goes, I know it's your first day, but you're a guitar player, right? And I said, well, yeah. And he goes, well, you're, you're playing. Go get your guitar. <laughs> so uh, he taught me a really great lesson that first day. I remember being like, man, I, you know, I don't know if I'm good enough. Are you sure you want to use me? And he goes, okay, stop. First lesson. If a producer says, hey, come play on this, you say, sure, yeah, I can do that. You just you <laughs> ne never doubt yourself and just, just say, sure, I can do that. Even if you don't know if you can or if you should, just say, yeah, cool, I'll do it. And then, then you just, then you're forced to deliver. And that's what happened. I, just, I got in front of the, the, the mic with an acoustic and then I laid down some electric parts and, and the parts turned out great. And he's like, dude, we're, we're changing your curriculum. You're, you're not an engineer. You're a, you're a musician and you're a, you're a, a songwriter. So we're, we're going to make sure that you, that, that we're expanding the musical gifts that you have because you, you, you don't need to be sitting behind the board. You need to be on the other side of the glass tracking. And so that, that was a big direction shift for me of, okay, I've just been validated that I have the goods. So now I just need to cultivate that and get better and better. What, uh, were there any other lessons that really stuck out in your mind from that internship? Uh, yeah. Um, that was the first big one is that don't doubt yourself. Don't, don't try to talk yourself down, you know, just say sure. And then figure out how to do it. Uh, that was the first one. And then another one is, uh, I tend to rush a lot early on when I was, you know, learning how to play in the studio. So my, my mentor producer was, uh, was very, uh, adamant about that. Like as soon as I'd start rushing, he'd stop playback and he'd say, do it again, don't rush. And then he, and we start tracking again, he'd stop it and say, do it again, don't rush. And then I, I noticed this pattern of, oh, I tend to want to play ahead of the beat. I should, I should lay it back. And so that was a really good, you know, for a good, teaching moment for me for a producer just to you know relentlessly call me out do it again don't rush <laughs> and then so it, it finally stuck in my brain that okay it's cool to lay it back and and learning about how to make a record and what should be on a song and what shouldn't be on a song you know he really taught me about you know the the concept everybody knows but it really is so true of of less is more you know don't don't stack 10 guitars because it might not be needed, you know, mute it and, and, and until you miss it. And then in very often a more sparse spaced out arrangement of a song is more emotionally impactful than just jamming a bunch of tracks together, you know? Uh, so that, that, that was another big lesson for me is just take it one, one piece at a time. And when it feels good, it feels good. Leave it alone. Awesome. Okay. You got your start in sort of a nineties grunge rock era, but Currently, you're doing more country music. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, moving to Nashville, the reason why I wanted to come here was not only to learn from this producer in a, in a studio environment, but I also wanted to go after you know the the ultimate dream, which was you know playing arenas, which was you know living on a tour bus and being being in a new city every night and just having you know not just playing a bar, but like playing a stadium playing these mm -hmm. big, big places and just knowing what it felt like to be backstage in an arena, you know, and then the lights go out and the whole place starts screaming and a little guy with a flashlight is leading you up the stairs. You know, I wanted to experience what that was like from the musician standpoint or from the artist standpoint. So that's why I moved here because it just, it, it was either LA, New York or Nashville. And to me, 
it just made sense that me being from Texas, uh, I, I like to wear cowboy boots on stage. So I was like, all right, maybe Nashville <laughs> makes sense. And, you know, it's such a touring hub and there's a tons of different music here, but really it's, it's the home base for country music. So I kind of made that call that, you know, it makes sense for me to, to, you know, if, if I'm going to choose a genre and go after it and I'm in Nashville, it makes sense to, uh, kind of lean more the, uh, the country route. And so that's, uh, that's where it started. And right around the time I met, uh, Gio, which is our mutual friend, um, I met a, a fiddle player who wanted to, to start a group. And uh, he really liked the way that I played and sang and wrote. And so this is when the, uh, the, the trios were really hot. Lady Annabellum, the country group, uh, had mm-hmm. just really broken big. And uh, the band Perry was happening. So the trio thing was, you know, the mixed trio. So we, we found a girl singer that was really charismatic and had a lot of stage presence and, and, and energy. And so we formed this country trio and we were really good. I mean, we, we were three very different personalities and, uh, you know, you couldn't have picked three more different people to try to put in a, in a band together. So the personalities were, were tough to manage, but musically, man, as soon as we started playing, Brian, it was, we, we really had something. And so we were, uh, quickly discovered by a producer in town named Blake Chancy, And, he was the producer of the first two albums by the Dixie Chicks that won all those Grammys and uh, uh, some other big country artists as well, uh, uh, Montgomery Gentry and Kelly Pickler. And so he saw something in us that, you know, wow, this this group is good and I'm going to produce them and I'm going to try to shop them around for a record deal. So th- that began a five year journey in Nashville of, of that band, uh, you know, learning, you know, the the ups and downs of being an act that has the the songs has the talent, but now how do we navigate to the promised land of getting that first record deal? And then how do we get that hit single? And then how do we get on that tour? You know, so that became a big educational experience for me learning what a producer's role is and, and, you know, actually having like a, a, a big time manager from a big time management company and the process of, of, grooming a young artist or a young group uh to perform these showcases in nashville to try to get a record deal so that became uh my my focus for the the, essentially the first five years i was i was in nashville was developing this trio showcasing for all the record labels in town uh we made a music video we put a song on the radio and that that band was called scarletta and that was kind of the next step in learning what this industry is all about, you know, we, we, we hired a booking agent and we hired a business manager. And so I started learning the different parts of, of a touring act. It's not just the band and crew. It's, it's your manager, it's your business manager, it's your producer, it's your agent. And then we started, I started to see the, the financial realities of being an artist and it was a very uh, pretty crappy realization of, Oh wow, we're the last ones to get paid. We're the ones, <laughs> we're the ones on stage doing it. But you know, when you're making, you know, maybe 800 bucks for, for a, a show at, at some bar, you know, there are commissions you have to pay. You got a 10% goes to your manager, 10% goes to your booking agent, 5% goes to your, uh, your business manager. And then you got to pay your band. And so very often what we quickly realized is that, and then there's hotels and gas and food. So what we quickly realized is when we were this, this young band with no hits and we couldn't get very big guarantees, we quickly realized that, you know, after we paid our commissions to our team and paid our band and bought gas and hotels, that sometimes there just wasn't any money left over. So that was kind of a major shock to the system of, well, that sucks. But, uh, you know, it was also motivation to uh, be, to to work hard enough to put enough bodies in the room wherever you are, so you can ask for a bigger guarantee. So there is money left over uh, for you as the artist. So it was a a really great learning experience for me, uh, but it definitely added to the struggle financially because I'd, I'd come home from three days on the road and then I'd have to go wait tables and sling cheeseburgers uh, in Nashville just to 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 be able to pay the pay the rent. So it was, uh, yeah. 
it was quite, quite the quite the learning experience, and I, I wouldn't trade it. But um, I, I kind of moved into a new phase um, after after that band, and, and I, can, I can go there. But I'm sure you have some questions as well. Uh, so, is that when Song Division came in, or was there an intermediary step there? There was an intermedi- intermediary step there. So after about five years of you know touring in a van and playing a lot of shows that really didn't mean much, uh, you know, like playing at a at a chicken chicken wing bar putting on a full band show, but every, but people are more interested in in the hockey game on TV. That was kind of that moment of like, what are we doing? This, the, yeah, no. So <laughs> a lot of my musician friends, they, they didn't do the original act thing. They kind of went straight to offering their services uh, to, uh, you know, the big boys, the, the, the artists with record deals and uh, you know, number one hits. And so I decided to leave that band and uh, so I just I just started putting the word out to my musician friends of, hey, uh, I'm not doing the original thing anymore with this band. Uh, I want to get on the bus and I want to I want to offer my services as a guitar player and a, and a background singer to whoever needs it. And so, you know, Nashville is such a small, tight community of musicians that, you know, once you start putting the feelers out, you start getting calls. So that's when I, I got my first major label gig uh, with an artist named Jana Kramer. She had a couple a couple hits. She was an actress on a TV show called One Tree Hill. And so once you're kind of in that club with these musicians that play for the artists, uh, you know, you meet all the other ones backstage and catering or, or, you know, at the festivals. And so I did that for about another four years. I was with Jana for a year. Uh, I was with an artist named Cassidy Pope for two years uh, touring with her. And we, we then th- those were those that's where these dreams started coming true of being in the arena you know, being backstage when the lights go out and being on these big tours, playing in front of tens of thousands of people. Uh, I got to do that, you know, three nights a week for about four years. It was, it was amazing. Uh, and, and then that's when song division, uh, kind of came into the picture a little bit. I, I had done some, some, some jobs with them just as a hired musician, you know, being, being the band at this corporate, you know, ballroom party kind of thing. Uh, but then in 2019 is when they reached out, they said, Hey, listen, we need someone in Nashville who's worked a bunch of these corporate jobs as a musician, but we're looking for somebody that might want to represent the company and actually sell this stuff to, you know, Chick-fil-A or Dr. Pepper or, 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 or any of these major corporations that, that do these events. Would you be interested in that? And I said, yeah, sure. Why not? I was kind of ready to, to stop traveling. I had, I had toured for 10 years. So, uh, the timing of it worked out really well. And that's when I started transitioning into song division and uh, uh, providing, you know, my music skills to help corporations at their events have, uh, you know, this, you know, bond people you know, and unite people using the power of music. Okay. So um, pretend like I'm a potential client. What is your elevator speech for what song division does? <laughs> okay, I'll give it to you. Uh, so I'd say, well, uh, hey, Brian, I really appreciate you reaching out to me uh, today. Uh, you know, naturally, you'll have some questions for me about what we do at Song Division and I'll have a lot of questions for you. So uh, here's who we are at Song Division. We, we're, we're a global leader in music based programming and our whole goal is to unite people around their purpose using music and music is really powerful in that way because it, it makes you feel good. You know, anytime there's music in the air, whether it's in a, in a ballroom in person or whether we're doing it over zoom with, with your team, uh, music makes you feel good. Your body's flooded with, with dopamine and, and we want your team to be in that mindset. Um, it also strengthens bonds, experiencing music together makes your team feel closer together. And, um, it inspires memorable experiences. So if there's things your team needs to learn, we use music to help them retain it and to help them absorb the information and then retain it. So we do this in a lot of different ways. We will write a song with your team about whatever it is they need to be learning. We teach non-musical people how to write a song. We demystify the whole process. Or if you're having a big event, you know, we can put a band on stage and be like the roots at, for the, for Jimmy Fallon on the tonight show, you know, we can play people on and off stage with customized stingers about that person. We can play the party. We can host lip sync battles. Basically our job is just to make any event, whether it's 
in person or virtual, make it way more memorable and engaging and exciting uh, using something everybody loves, which is music. That's awesome. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. D- did I sell you on it? Yeah, yeah, that was good. Um, so let's let's say that client call goes well. What does that process look like then? What sort of information do you guys take in? And then how do you go about designing that? Because it sounds like you've got a lot of different offerings. How do you go about designing that program for that particular client? Yeah, so so much of it is just asking questions and uh, you know getting getting to the meat of what their of what their pain is. You know, like wh- what's the problem that we can help fix? And we kind of view ourselves almost like a consultant of of culture at any corporations. Uh, uh, for, for any corporation. So it might be, well, you know, since the pandemic, we haven't seen each other and we're all missing each other a lot. And we want something, a, a reason to come together. And, uh, you know, they might say, well, you know, we're, we're just kind of bored and we want to be entertained. And so that's my clue of, oh, okay, well, here's what we would do. We'd get everybody on Zoom and, and we have this musical happy hour program where it's just an hour of nonstop fun and entertainment with, with, professional touring musicians as your, as your hosts, where we, uh, we do a game, a musical game show and we write a song about somebody on the spot and we do a dance off, you know, things like that. Or they might say, well, our team, we really want to create something together. You know, we, we need to do a, a, some sort of team building and, uh, we're not sure how to do that virtually. What, what should we do? And for that, I would say, well, our team building is we, we'll guide you through how to write a song and we'll get your teams to work together to write original lyrics about your company and we'll teach them how to do it. And then we'll perform their song back to you that they've written using th- only their lyrics that they wrote. Uh, so it's all about discovering, you know, what they need or if there's, if they have this multi-day virtual event, they would come to us and say, how do we make this cool? Cause it's really going to be, our people have to be on watching this live stream for three days straight. What do you recommend to make it a little more energizing and engaging and fun? So, you know, there's things we would do where I would pitch an idea of, well, what if we did, what if we wrote a custom song, like, like the events theme song. And we, we launched the whole thing with this big kickoff anthem and, and, and create a hype video with it. Something just to start it off with a bang. And so that gets people excited of like, oh, cool. You know, that sounds awesome. So that's one thing we would do. Or like throughout the day, we would, you know, I, I, last week I had this client that wanted these little short energizer videos. So I, I filmed and, and recorded these 10 little little slices of, of 30 or 45 seconds of me like hyping them up. Like one of, <laughs> one of them was like a... a a, a virtual stretch break where I put on like this dorky headband from the eighties and played footloose. And I was like, all right, everybody out of your seats, put your hands out, show me some spirit sprinkles, wiggle your fingers, you know, things like that. Just like <laughs> things to just pep it up and just make it a little bit more, a little bit less boring and a little bit more entertaining and engaging. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really all about just figuring out what their pain is, what do they need? And then how can we use music to, uh, uh, to help that? That's that's terrific. And then you work with a lot of other musicians. It looked like you guys had a roster of hundred plus musicians that you guys work with. We do, yeah. Um, we each kind of have our little teams now. Um, so it's been really cool. It's been such a blessing because, especially during the pandemic, you know, everything went virtual, and virtual became the thing. And we were we we were one of the only companies that really figured out how to take our approach to an event and take it virtual and make a virtual zoom or, or a whatever kind of event, make it more exciting. So I was able to hire a lot of my musician friends that were really needing work. I could say, Hey, do you want to come to this studio? And we're going to, we're going to write a song, you know, in about 20 minutes and play it in front of a hundred thousand virtual viewers. You want to come do that? And like, yeah, <laughs> cool. So, you know, I, I, I've probably gotten to hire 20 or 30 different Nashville musicians who've pretty much been out of work, but I, I it's been amazing to be able to offer them, Hey man, it's a corporate gig. So I can pay you 500 bucks for, for two hours. You want to come do it? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's put me in a really nice position just to be able to help. You know, it's been a tough time for musicians, but it's, it's nice to be able to give them something that 
is is it's it's a real job. It's virtual, but it's but it's real, and and you'll get paid. Here we go. Yeah, I'm, I imagine. Uh, are you looking forward to getting back to doing that in person at corporate events? I imagine that is a totally different experience than the virtual. Yeah. Uh, y- y- yes and no. Um, it's crazy because I haven't I haven't played music in front of a real audience in in exactly a year, which is blows my mind because you know that. I, I, for the past, you know, 22 years or so, I've just constantly been playing shows or, you know, being a hired guitar player for somebody or touring with an artist or doing cover gigs, but they're always in front of people in a, in a live venue situation. So going back to in person, it, it would be cool because, you know, I haven't traveled much in a year. I've taken maybe one or two flights, but, you know, I was kind of nervous the whole time. So it, it'll be cool to, you know, once we're, once we're post pandemic to be able to, go somewhere but we're, we've kind of been having the talks internally at, at song division of like okay well when things go back to in person you know there's always going to be this virtual component to events now you know they're all going to be what they're calling it hybrid where it's going to be a live event but there's going to be a lot of people that don't come that are watching it virtually and so they need to have some programming for the virtual people that are part of it you know something fun for them to get to do so uh it just depends on, you know, I think what we're going to do when we go back to in-person events is that we're just going to charge a heck of a lot more <laughs> because, you know, now that they're, you know, if, if I have to fly to Orlando for like a, an hour segment um, during this corporate event, uh, I, I could I could I could have been home and delivered four or five virtual events, you know. So we're kind of in that weird transition of like, how are we going to restructure live because virtual has been so uh efficient like all i do is i just walk into my garage and i have this green screen set up and uh, i log on to whatever platform we're on and i talk to a webcam for an hour and (laughs) then i go back and make coffee and that's that's one event and i could do three or four of those in a day rather than have to fly to minnesota yeah you've you've returned to your roots as a a garage band i (laughs) exactly (laughs) Totally true. Yeah. So I, I converted the garage to an office, but yeah, it's kind of, it's full circle. It's back where it started in the garage. Yeah. Now you've got at least one DJ and producer on your roster. What, um, what is their role when, because that's my core audience here. So what is their role when they participate in one of these virtual events? Yeah. So DJs are, are, are amazing because, you know, what, what we like to do with our DJs is uh, a couple different things. Sometimes, you know, in a big virtual event, they just want some like house music, you know, where they might have, they'll have a webcam on a DJ and he's spinning and he's doing his thing and he'll like talk in the microphone a little bit after each song. But, but, you know, all these platforms have chat boxes. And so people can request songs for the DJ to play. Uh, and he can say, all right, Jennifer wants to hear boys to men. All right, here you go, Jennifer play that kind of thing. Uh, so we use DJs as just, you know, like the, for the 30 minute lunch break during an eight hour event, you know, we'll have a, we'll do a DJ set. We also do stuff like lip sync battles where we'll have, you know, a DJ and a host, and then everybody gets on, on in a Zoom with us, and it's like a lip sync dance party where you know it's basically everyone has an excuse to all be in the same virtual space and you know hang out and have some drinks and and dance. But then if someone is, has a drink or two and is feeling uh, uh, ambitious, they can send a message to the DJ and say, "Hey, uh, play the karaoke track for Living on a Prayer because I'm about to lip sync." Bon Jovi. And then so we spotlight them and then the DJ plays the track and they lip sync to Bon Jovi to everyone's <laughs> inter- entertainment. So, uh, and we're, we're still coming up with new ways to incorporate our DJs, but um, we use them in live situations as well, in person situations, like, uh, you know, for the opening hype music before the, the, the MC walks out, the, the DJs, you know, pumping everybody up. And like during the show, if there's sound, sound effect drops that need to happen, you know, the, the, the DJ has a little monitor with the script and then at the right moment he can trigger the beep sound or whatever it needs to be. So they just use, we use DJs to enhance the production of any kind of event, whether it's in person or, or virtual. Okay. Awesome. Well, I know you are headed out to a gig virtually, so um, I know your time is limited here. Um, where can people find more about song division and, and your personal music career? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so with Song Division, it's just songdivision.com. You can check out all the things we do there. And uh, my personal music career, um, 
you can go to BenjiHarris.com, B-E-N-J-I Harris.com. That kind of has my whole story and, and how I've gotten to this point. And uh, I actually made a record with Geo in, in 2017 here in Nashville. And that I had all these songs that I had written over the past 10 years that were just sitting there collecting dust. And so I just figured... Why, why wouldn't I make a record? So uh, you can find me on anything that streams, whether it's Apple Music or Spotify or Rhapsody or wherever you get your music. Uh, just search my name and you'll, you can listen to my record that, that I made. I'm really proud of it. And uh, it's fun to you know, be able to be artistic and just put your own album out there of songs because you, you never know where it's going to end up. You know, I, I get sometimes like my little uh, royalty... My, my pathetic royalty checks that come in from it. Cause you know, it's hard to make any actual money from album sales or streaming or whatever, but I, I get reports of where my music is being streamed from. And I have this weird little fan base in Finland and Norway, you know, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> cool. Pretty like, cool. Oh, 35 yeah. people downloaded this song in Norway. Cool. You know? Yeah. It's, it's kind of fun to think, you know, I wonder what, what they were thinking and how they discovered my music and, you know, I hope they're enjoying it. And, uh, it, how to get a girl is a really cool song. Um, oh, so you. I will make sure I've got, uh, links to all that in the show notes page. And, uh, I noticed song division on the work page, you've got some really great examples and there's several of you performing both, both virtually and in person. So, uh, I'll try to gather up all those links on the show notes page at producerlifepodcast.com. Um, so uh, any any last minute thoughts for the audience? Thank you so much. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you for for having me. This was a lot of fun. I love uh, uh, you know doing podcasts and and you know interviews. And I I hope I didn't talk too much. Sometimes when I get going on telling my story, I can just keep going. So I hope I didn't bore you. It is so much easier when people talk. I'm really glad. No, you did a great job, and this was a lot of fun. So uh, thank you. Good deal. Well, yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, feel free to check out my stuff, search me on all the streaming sites. And uh, if you work for a, or if, if you either are with a company that needs help bringing their people together, or if you know people that work for a company that, uh, you know, needs some solutions for how do we keep our people to feeling closer together, especially if they're working remotely from home, we have ways to make people feel connected and have fun. And we use music to do it. It's the best way to do it. So hit us up. All right. Thanks so much, Benji. All right. Take care. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Make sure to check out the show notes at producerlifepodcast.com, episode 68. I'll have links to Benji's music, Song Division, and some videos showing you some of Song Division's different offerings to corporate clients. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do me a favor and leave a quick rating and review wherever you're listening. It helps others to find the podcast, and I would love to feature some of those reviews on a future episode. Until next week, this is the House Ninja reminding you to be somebody's hero today. 